with that, I'd just like to uh, turn everything over to uh, Tara Littlefield. Tara is president of the uh, Kentucky Native Plant Society, uh, and she's going to take it from here. So, Tara, you're All on. All right. Thank you, Jeff. Jeff is um, the, our Native Plant Society board member and, and webmaster, among many other things. So we'll hear more about um, Jeff's work at the end of the Botanical Symposium. So um, welcome, everybody. Super excited uh, to have everyone join this morning. It's a nice, sunny morning, at least here in central Kentucky. Um, so the Botanical Symposium. So we've been organizing um, in uh, this uh, Botanical Symposium in the, in the fall or winter uh, for many years now. Um, we started in 2014. Of course, last year uh, with the pandemic, we uh, uh, went virtual and, and it actually works out really well um, being virtual since there are a lot of talks. Um, so, you know, pandemic aside, we might continue um, with uh, with at least a, a large portion of the symposium being virtual so we can record the, the talks easily. So, but the goal in general um, for the symposium is to bring together um, all of our botanical community, professionals, community scientists, academics, researchers, gardeners, uh, and students in order to learn about what's going on in the world of Kentucky botany and beyond uh, surrounding states in the region. Um, lots of good stuff is happening. Um, there's a, a lot of uh, benefit to just providing everyone updates of what types of different projects and organizations are working on uh, you know, different, uh, different native plant projects across the state. So, you know, our goal is just to, to collaborate more and, and communicate more and, and, uh, and we feel that this is a, is, is a great way to do it. So, um, our first presentation, uh, that we're going to move into now is kind of, <laughs> we're going to bombard you with some rapid updates uh, from several staff uh, from the Office of Kentucky Nature Preserves. So I'm, I'm, I'm Tara Littlefield. I'm the president of the, the Native Plant Society, but I'm also a botanist and a plant conservation and natural heritage manager uh, for the Office of Kentucky Nature Preserves. So I work with a lot of really awesome botanists and ecologist folks that are also working on a lot of great native plant projects. Um, so we are going to just kind of give you some highlights of what we've been working on um, and also a few highlights of what Native Plant Society um, has uh, planned uh, in the coming months. So I will share my screen and pass it off to Heidi Braunreiter, who is uh, the Native Plant Society Vice President uh, and also a fellow botanist at the Office of Kentucky Nature Preserves. Heidi. Okay, hello everyone. Um, I'm just gonna talk about some of our upcoming events real quick. Um, this coming spring, our annual wildflower weekend will be at Natural Bridge State Park. Um, we are planning an in-person event with hikes and presentations and a Friday night social. Um, the event will be $10 to participate and we will offer discounts for membership renewals at the event. Um, and we're very excited to go back to in-person. So we hope you all join. Um, in addition to the Wildflower Weekend, we are holding a statewide botany blitz for the week leading up to Wildflower Weekend. Um, last year, we held a botany blitz in lieu of an in-person event, along with um, a bunch of virtual hikes that are still available on our website if you want to see them. Um, the botany blitz was such a success, and it definitely exceeded our expectations, so we wanted to continue with that in addition to our in-person event this year. Um, so last year, there were 110 observers in the group. Um, over 3,000 observations were made in just a week span, and 460 plant species were documented in Kentucky. So over 80% of those uh, reached research grade, meaning the ID was confirmed by other iNaturalist users. And you can see here on the slide um, some of the results of last year. Some people have fun with this as a competition. Um, so perhaps this coming year, you can try your hand at that. Um, we have a little tutorial on our YouTube page for how to get started if you've never used iNaturalist before, and it's very easy, so we hope you join. 
Um, and we're also planning uh, field trips for this coming year, but that is still in the preliminary stages. So definitely stay tuned to our Lady Slipper blog to hear more about those in the coming year. So if you have any questions about our upcoming events, just put those in the chat for me and I'll be happy to answer. Hi, I'm Rachel Cook with the Office of Kentucky Nature Preserves. Um, today, I'm gonna to talk to you guys about um, how I'll be updating the Kentucky Native Plant Society Native Plant Suppliers List um, that's on our website. So what we have currently um, uh, is what I compiled in um, January, February of 2020. And this was a survey that I had emailed out to a bunch of different suppliers and I had gathered all the information. And this year it's gonna look a little different. Um, this year we are going to have a form on the website. Um, so we're gonna be looking for people's contact information, you know, public emails, phone numbers if somebody needs to call, what hours you're open just to get a lot of clarity um, for people who are looking for to buy native plants. Um, we want like a good description of your business and what your nursery um, is all about. And then we want to collect a lot of good information on, are you wholesale? Are you, re are you just like selling to the public? Do you sell plugs or do you sell seeds? And then um, a big thing that we want to look into both as KMPS and as myself as at the Office of Kentucky Nature Preserves is where is this seed source coming from? Is it um, local to Kentucky? Is it coming from adjacent states? We really want to get a better idea of where the genetic material of these native plants that are being sold are coming from and get an idea of how that is being distributed throughout the state. And then this year, we also really want to highlight what services are available. So do you provide landscape design? Um, are you a business that is looking to help um, landowners remove invasive species? Um, do you help uh, landowners install native plant gardens? So we really want to highlight that. And then again, this year, we want to look at um, are invasives being sold? At these business, at your business, um, and really um, make sure that we know where these products are being sold. Obviously, big box stores, but we want to kind of help um, people who want to buy native plants know exactly who they're buying from and what other products are available. Some um, more. So this form is going to be housed on the KMPS website. Therefore, if any point throughout the year, some information has changed or you just got your business started or something along those lines is going to be available year round and be updated more often rather than once a year. That way people can see what's up to date on our website. And then um, for the future, I think Jeff, aka Mr. Webmaster, is going to be working um, to have a similar form so that we can also track native plant sales. Like if you're just someone growing a lot of native plants and you <laughs> want to sell them because you have too many or uh, do like a seed swap, something like that, we're going to have a form available um, for that on the website, hopefully soon so that um, you, we can have that for 2022 now that things are more in person. And then um, we've kind of talked about looking into a way to record how restorations are like have a way to track restorations in the state like who's making restoration sites, where are these restoration sites at, what's being planted. And that really helps us at the Office of Kentucky Nature Preserves because sometimes we come across these great things that we think are remnants and we later find out that they are just really good restorations. And that's just something that we would like to um, keep track of. So that might be coming in the future once we kind of figure out the logistics of that. All right, so I'm just gonna give a a few highlights from the Office of Kentucky Nature Preserves. Um, let's see. So first, um, I'll update you all on the Kentucky Plant Conservation Alliance. So this is a kind of a, a group that the Office of Kentucky Nature Preserves and Native Plant Society 
has created over the past five years were um, uh, kind of a subset of, of both um, of those organizations. And we're a, pu a public-private partnership of state and federal agencies, land managers, uh, researchers, botanical gardens, conservation horticulturalists, nonprofits, um, private sector, volunteers committed to protecting native plants and natural communities of conservation concern. So rare plants, rare communities, um, with the goal of preventing plant extinctions. So currently, the um, our Office of Kentucky uh, Nature Preserve staff um, uh, coordinate most of these projects. Um, and we started this uh, because we recognized there was, a, there was a need for a greater focus on rare plants um, and we, we formed the Alliance in, in 2016. So we also, um, this group um, also uh, uh, networks with the greater region, uh, the Southeastern Plant Conservation Alliance. Um, and as I said, the, the, a lot of the projects are coordinated by our botanists at uh, the nature preserves. Um, and what we do, collaborative, we um, organize collaborative meetings like the Native Clover Conservation Meeting that was last year. Um, we organize work days, outreach, uh, volunteer building, things like that. So a lot of those uh, projects that we've started um, you know, our single species projects, working on rare plants, and also just kind of looking at ways that we can expand the conservation strategy of these rare plants into the conservation horticultural world. Um, so I'll highlight a few of these. Um, you can see here on the on this uh, on the slide. The first one I'll highlight is Kentucky clover. So Kentucky clover is a globally endangered uh, bluegrass woodland species. It's endemic to Kentucky. It's actually functionally extinct in the wild already, um, but we were able to collect seed. And um, you know, what do you do if, if a rare plant is, is really rare and you want to try to increase populations or um, you know, protect uh, existing populations? So we, we do a lot of seed banking. Um, we've partnered with the Cincinnati Zoo. Um, Valerie Pence uh, leads that group um, on um, propagating Kentucky clover. Um, Office of Kentucky Nature Preserve staff have been managing sites um, that are a suitable habitat for the Kentucky clover for introductions. Um, and we've partnered with Kentucky Native Plant Society on organizing uh, meetings uh, to conserve the Kentucky clover. So I'm happy to report that, that this is uh, one of those rare plants that has come full circle uh, in terms of uh, collecting seed, uh, managing habitat, working with conservation horticulturalists. And then uh, just this past month, we uh, transplanted uh, close to 100 Kentucky clover plants back into the wild, into um, high quality habitat. Um, so. Those are ways that we're just using partnership and, and expanding um, outreach uh, to protect and expand some of these rare plants. Another uh, plant that I wanted to highlight um, that's also come full circle is the wood lily. Um, so the wood lily, it's this really gorgeous plant right here um, in the corner on this slide. It's a state endangered pine barren species that grows in the Cumberland Plateau. Um, and these links, um, I forgot to mention, um, we do have articles that detail exactly the whole entire project on the Native Plant Society website. So, so go to the website to find out more, um, more details about exactly all the different work that's been done to, to conserve these species. Um, but back to the wood lily, um, this species we started in uh, 2016, uh, trying to um, collect seed of it. So this is a, a rare plant that occurs on roadsides and power lines and there was a lot of threats to this species in terms of mowing regimes and loss of habitat from the, the pine barrens uh, community, lack of fire, herbivory, things like that. So we were losing a, a large amount of our population. So we partnered with um, folks like uh, Drop Seed Nursery, the Daniel Boone National Forest, Kentucky Heartwood, uh, Collected Seed, um, 
uh, we had to set out cages on these wood lily plants in order uh, to prevent the, the plants from being um, browsed by deer in order to collect seed. We worked with uh, Margaret Shea at Drop Seed Nursery uh, to propagate this plant. And she has been uh, working for the past several years to, to perfect the technique of, of propagating this plant and, and has done a fantastic job. Um, and I'm happy to say that this year, Five years after we started this project, um, we were able to transplant over 500 wood lily bulbs into over five different natural areas uh, within, the, uh, within um, the Cumberland Plateau. A lot of that was on the Dana Boone National Forest. Some of it was on nature preserve property. Um, and then there's a private land there as well. So uh, super excited about that project and, and look at the article for more information. Another plant that I'll just highlight is the uh, mountain lover, um, the Kistamacambii. This is a globally rare um, evergreen subshrub uh, that grows on limestone outcrops in the uh, cliff section of the Cumberland Plateau region. Um, and this is one that we just started um, over the past two years, uh, expanding um, our work with this uh, species. We've partnered with Atlanta Botanical Garden uh, uh, to collect cuttings from the majority of our Kentucky populations. Um, and they now have them in propagation there in Atlanta. Um, and we've partnered with the Dana Boone National Forest and also Berea College Forest and nature preserves. Um, so eventually within the next year or two, we will um, get a lot of those plants back and transplant them back into high quality suitable habitat. And then last I'll highlight um, the four rose angled gentian. So um, uh, rose gentian. So this is a state endangered wet meadow species that occurs in the Eastern Highland Rim in Kentucky. Um, this species was just discovered uh, for the state uh, just last year. Um, and it was the first time that this species had been um, documented uh, west of the Appalachian Mountains. So extremely disjunct from uh, the coastal plain and Piedmont habitat of the southeast where the main range of this plant occurs. This plant occurred on private land and, uh, and we're still working on protection efforts of this one population. But unfortunately, uh, the landowner um, uh, did not want to sell and uh, really wanted that habitat for a different purpose. Um, so uh, we worked tirelessly over the past uh, two years to collect seed of this plant. And we've partnered with Ironweed Nursery, Alicia Bosella, to propagate it and transplant it into um, uh, wet meadow, protected wet meadow habitat. So that occurred this year. We're still um, monitoring the progress of those transplants. Um, so that's a, a, another really great project um, that involves multiple partners. I mean, a lot of these, uh, uh, you know, rare, rare plant and, and natural community conservation um, takes a lot of partnerships um, and a lot of effort to really make a difference to make sure that these, these plants and, and communities are protected in the long term. I wanted to just mention something that's that's a pretty uh, exciting uh, thing that's happening now uh, for plant conservation in Kentucky. A lot of you might know um, of the state wildlife action plans. Um, for um, uh, every state has one. They're multi-year strategies uh, in which every U.S. state and territory assesses the health of its wildlife and lays out steps for conserving it over the long term. So these plans establish a framework for conservation efforts um, that aim to protect species before they are endangered with each plan custom fitted to its jurisdiction's unique needs and priorities. So traditionally state wildlife action plans have just included animals um, and the uh, Fish and Wildlife Agencies lead these plans. Um, and over the past 10 years, there's, there's really been a lot of work um, uh, from different plant conservationists to start including uh, groups like plants in these state wildlife action plans. So I'm happy to report that Kentucky is one of those states. So currently right now, um, we're in the southeast region. About half of the states currently have plants within their state wildlife action plans as species of greatest conservation need. 
Um, and we are actively now working with Kentucky Fish and Wildlife over the next year and a half to add plants um, to, to the swaps. So that's, that's really great. Um, that will expand um, a lot of, uh, uh, of targeted uh, plant conservation um, for a lot of our rare plants. So we're really excited about that. Um, we're also, um, it's kind of a, an overlapping project, but every four years we, we update on um, the Kentucky rare plant list. Um, and we are um, currently, uh, Devin Rogers is, is, is uh, helping a lot, out a lot with this project, is assessing all of the plants in the state to make sure that, that we know what the, what the conservation status is of all of our rare plants. So um, once we get that, that new updated rare plant list, um, um, finished, then we will work on a subset of those rare plants um, in different priority actions and in, in, in conservation and add those into the state wildlife action plan. So, so that's really exciting. Um, and then I'll just uh, end with um, just giving you all an update of our rare plant and community monitoring on, um, on our natural areas across the state. So over 65% of our rare plants um, are in disturbance dependent communities. So disturbance dependent, that's the open grassland communities, glades, barrens, wet meadows, bogs, seeps, um, you know, communities that need fire or woody removal or other disturbances in order to uh, maintain those habitats. So uh, the Office of Kentucky Nature Preserves um, is really trying to, to um, expand our, our science-based um, conservation strategies of these rare plants and natural communities and, and work um, in collaboration with natural areas managers on, um, on monitoring and uh, you know, looking at different ways to measure success of management prescriptions um, and to study the effects of practices on rare species and communities. Um, so with this new um, effort in collaboration with natural area managers, um, we have over the past 10 years uh, set up over 150 long-term monitoring plots across the state. And these are primarily all within our remnant grassland communities. Uh, these uh, 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 plots, uh, vegetation plots, look at management effects over time and they also help us classify these uh, communities. Um, we look at the floristic quality assessments of the plants that occur there. Um, and then within these monitoring plots, we also have, you know, single species, um, rare species monitoring uh, embedded within them. So um, just, just letting you guys know that, um, you know, there's a lot of science that goes into looking at how um, these species in these communities um, uh, change over time and, and how um, our actions affect um, their conservation. So I'll pass it along to Tony. All right, hi everybody, I'm Tony Romano. I'm a botanist with Kentucky Nature Preserves and I'm gonna provide a, a quick update to uh, our roadside grassland project that was started in 2020. Um, so just this very brief background uh, roadsides have increasingly gained recognition for their potential conservation value. Uh, they've been shown to provide uh, important habitat for, for pollinating insects, um, including some at-risk species like the monarch and the rusty patch bumblebee. Uh, and these roadsides can also provide really important refugia for rare and conservative grassland plant species. Uh, so in recognition of that, uh, we've started a statewide uh, roadside survey project. And Tara, if you wanna to go to the next slide. Um, so this is a five-year project we initiated in 2020. Um, it's in partnership with the Kentucky Transportation Cabinet. And so the goal of this project is to uh, survey all of the state maintained roads uh, over the course of five years with the goal of identifying and evaluating remnant habitats, uh, rare species, and also pollinator resources. Uh, so this map shows kind of our, uh, our plan uh, as you can see, uh, we're, we're splitting it up so that each year we survey about 20 to 25 counties. Uh, in 2020, we surveyed the counties that are highlighted in blue. Uh, so that's primarily the Big Barrens region of the state. And then in 2021, we surveyed all the counties in that uh, light pink color. So it's uh, more southeast, including the Cumberland Plateau. And then next year, we'll be moving on to uh, Western Kentucky. 
And just to show you what that looks like um, a little in a little more detail, uh, this is our progress map to date. So all of those uh, blue colored roads are ones that have been surveyed so far. It's about 13,000 miles of road. So it's a, a pretty uh, significant effort. And then all of those little stars are sites where we've conducted a habitat evaluation. Uh, so that means there was something there that, uh, you know, one of our, bot our botanists saw and, and decided to, to pull over and take a look. Um, and so I'll just kind of go over our uh, results quickly. As I said, we've, we've completed 13,000 miles of road and we evaluated 200 sites. Um, out of those, we identified over 140 sites that had either a rare plant present or some other uh, grassland indicator species. So some sort of, uh, uh, like a good example is the liatris in this photo. So something that indicates that maybe this used to be a remnant grassland or it's otherwise a sun loving plant that requires kind of a, a more open uh, condition to persist. And so we found 62 sites in 2020 that kind of met that criteria. And then this past year, we found 83 sites that met that criteria. Um, but the quality of these sites does uh, vary pretty dramatically. So some of them are high quality. Other than other ones are uh, pretty badly degraded and, and sort of the uh, desirable species are just barely hanging on. So, so they're not all created equally. Uh, out of all of these sites, we've identified 30 grasslands uh, that we would consider good or better quality, uh, but I am still reviewing this year's data, so that, that number might actually go up as we uh, finish our analysis for this past year. And we're, we're ranking these sites based on size, presence of rare species, what the threats are, and the overall uh, floristic composition. And one of the takeaways that we've uh, continued to see over the past two years is that the highest quality sites are, are pretty rare. They're, they're thin on the ground. So it really underscores the importance of this project to identify these sites and work with KYTC to modify management so that hopefully they uh, continue to support these species. And just a brief update on our uh, rare species observations from this project. This is just kind of a fun stat, but so far we have observed approximately 816 plant species um, so that's not quite 30% of our flora, but uh, I'm interested to see what that number will be at the end of the five-year project. I think it'll actually be um, close to the majority of our flora. And then in 2020, we documented 16 new rare plant populations, and we also updated uh, 37 existing roadside records, uh, essentially confirming that those species are still there and, and assessing the population. And then in 2021, we documented 25 new rare plant populations on roadsides, and we were able to update over 40 existing records. Um, so that's good progress, and I'm excited to see what uh, comes in the next few years. And then uh, just one quick little plug here before I finish. Uh, we do have a iNaturalist project set up for people who wanna uh, help make roadside observations. As I said earlier, our project is limited to the state-maintained roads. So that includes the interstates, the US highways, and then the state highways. But we're not able to look at our smaller local roads and county roads and things like that. Um, so that would be a great way for people to participate is to join the Sci Naturalist project and uh, submit observations of native plants um, on those types of roads. Because we do review that information periodically, and we've had some really great finds on there uh, that we weren't aware of. So uh, you know, please consider joining that project. And that's all I have. Sorry, I'm Vanessa Velker. I'm a botanist with uh, OKNP. Um, today, I'm gonna to be talking a little bit about some iNaturalist projects we've got going. Um, also our new Adopt a Rock House program. So uh, our big year contest is a friendly competition or a personal challenge for people to find and identify as many species in a given year within a particular geographic area. Um, this type of contest originated in the birding world, but over the past several years, it's really taken off in the plant nerd realm as well. So 2021 is Kentucky's third annual competition. Um, you can see from a recent snapshot of the leaderboard that there are some clear leaders of the pack this year. 
However, there's still time to upload your plant observations from 2021. Um, I'm not gonna lie to you and tell you that it's anybody's game right now in December, but 2022 is just around the corner. Um, so we'd be really happy to see everybody join up uh, if you're actively botanizing in Kentucky. Um, and our next project I wanna highlight is the Kentucky Plants of Conservation Concern. Um, this is a, a collector project that automatically pulls in all observations that are identified as endangered, threatened, or of special concern in Kentucky. Um, with so many citizen scientists' eyeballs covering so much ground, uh, I naturally, our iNaturalist observers are actually helping us at OKNP to um, to keep tabs on occurrences of rare plant species in the state. And they're also discovering new unknown to us occurrences. Um, so the number of our species observations on INAT that we've been able to pull has been steadily increasing over the last few years um, since we started monitoring this fight. So if you, again, if you're an active botanizer, we'd love to have you join this group um, because we, we really value the citizen science observations. Um, and the final thing I want to talk about is our new Adopt a Rock House volunteer program. In 2022, we're excited to be rolling this out. Um, this will help us continue to collect population data on the recently delisted species white haired goldenrod. Um, this is a very rare goldenrod species. It's a Kentucky endemic. It occurs only in the Red River Gorge area of Menifee, Powell, and Wolf counties. Um, and within that small area, it only grows on the ledges and protected areas behind the drip line of sandstone rock houses. Um, the species was declared federally threatened in 1988, and through uh, diligent surveying, monitoring, and protection efforts, white haired goldenrod in the gorge made substantial recoveries, and the species was delisted in 2016. Um, at that point, a five-year post-delisting monitoring plan was put into place to keep tabs on those populations, and that monitoring plan has reached its final year this year. Um, however, even with that successful recovery, populations of white-haired goldenrod are still vulnerable to trampling or digging or invasive species. So to that end, we are seeking the assistance of uh, citizen scientists to help us keep an eye on these populations that are still exposed to recreational impacts. Um, and with our US Forest Service partners and Dan Dorson, we're developing um, mobile data collection survey and reference materials to train volunteers to continue the same monitoring protocols that we've been doing for the last five years. Um, so far, we've had a really great response from enthusiastic citizen scientists interested in the program, but we still have volunteer openings and rock houses that people can adopt. So if you are interested in hearing more about the program or you'd like to be a volunteer monitor, we'd love to hear from you. Um, you can send me an email at vanessa.velker at ky.gov and I'll put that in the comments in a minute um, and to request an adopt a rock house volunteer application. Okay. Um, hi, hello, good morning. Uh, my name is Kendall McDonald. I'm a botanist and lichenologist with Office of Kentucky Nature Preserves. Um, and I am the lead on the Kentucky Forest Biodiversity Assessment Program and our lichen and bryophyte list. So I'm just gonna give you guys brief updates because we are behind on the schedule. Um, so just an overview of the Forest Biodiversity Assessment Program. Uh, we plan to do a full state inventory within five years <clears throat> of Kentucky. And to achieve that, we are surveying 20% of Kentucky counties per year. We started this um, in 2019 in partnership with the Kentucky Department of Ag. Um, this program focuses on rare and conservative forested plant species, forest community uh, diversity and structure, herbaceous diversity, uh, forest medicinal and species of commercial concern, <clears throat> invasive species and other threats, and old growth analysis. Um, just to give you some progress and tentative findings, we're kind of in the middle of this project. Uh, three of five uh, years of our field work <clears throat> have been completed. Uh, two years have the data has been analyzed and reported, um, but we're still working on year three uh, for that. We uh, you know, since we've started, we have surveyed over 150 uh, forest blocks 
And within uh, those forest blocks, uh, we've documented approximately 70 new populations of species of conservation concern. Um, and that is defined by the state ranks. Um, the state uh, ranks go from S1 to F5, S1 being the most rare and S5 being the least rare. So um, species of conservation concern. In this context, we include uh, S1 through S3 species. Um, we also have documented over 550 occurrences of United Plant Saver at Risk Species. This is an organization that determines um, medicinal and commercial uh, plant species that um, have a lot of risk of becoming extinct um, due to human over harvesting. Um, We've analyzed a lot of threats for Kentucky forests and um, the most prominent aggressive uh, threat to Kentucky forests is definitely uh, non-native invasive species encroachment. Um, and over the last three uh, years, three species have really stood out to us being Japanese stiltgrass, uh, multiflora rose and Japanese honeysuckle. Going forward, um, Excuse my poorly made map here. I just made it in paint to be really quick. Um, but going forward, we have two more years of field work and every single county that is in white here um, are counties that need to be surveyed in the next two years. Um, we work with public and private landowners. So I just like to throw it out there. If you have or know of a forest block um, that is high quality, diverse, has uh, forest, may have forest medicinals or species of conservation or commercial concern. Um, you are welcome to contact me and we can talk about the property and vet it and see if it fits into this program. Um, I'll put my email into the chat, uh, but it's right there, kindle.mcdonald at ky.gov. Um, so if you have a property, uh, that you think would fit into this program, please email me and we can discuss it. And this is uh, the last thing I'm gonna talk about. This is uh, gonna be really quick. Um, Nature Preserves has been working on lichens and bryophytes um, with partners, especially uh, Dr. Alan Risk from Moorhead State University. Um, to create the state lichen and bryophyte lists. So um, unlike other groups in Kentucky, lichens and bryophytes are pretty understudied and um, misunderstood uh, of what we have here in the state of Kentucky. So lots of work has gone in to creating a full uh, state lichen and bryophyte list. Um, and once we have those lists, uh, we are using the NatureServe uh, rank calculator to give these species a state conservation rank so we can determine their rarity and our future monitoring and management priorities for these species. We're still in the middle of this project. And um, to be honest, I've done more with the lichens than the bryos at this point. So I can give you some tentative findings from the lichens. Right now we have approximately 680 lichen species in the state. Um, but Kentucky is still under collected, um, mostly, especially in the crust lichen area. Um, so if someone is an expert in crust lichens, eventually, I expect that the number of Kentucky lichen species will go up. Um, but those are just really hard to collect and identify. Um, and you have to really, really uh, have a lot of practice uh, with those. Um, as going through those, we have over 100 potentially rare lichens, um, and that ranking is still going on right now. Um, I've definitely been a little more liberal with which ones are going to go through the ranking calculator, but I would rather cover a little too much than not cover enough. Um, so if you guys would like to contribute to this project, um, it's obviously still ongoing, we're not done yet. Um, please post any lichen or bryophyte uh, observations to iNaturalist. There is a Lichens of Kentucky project that I have been managing for a couple years now. Um, and since we've added bryophytes to this, within the next couple uh, weeks, I plan on making a bryophytes of Kentucky project to manage and to pull observations from there. So if you'd like to contribute, you can post uh, lichen and bryophyte photos and observations on iNaturalist or 
you can send um, those photos uh, to my email. And again, I will put that in the chat. And that is all I have. Thanks, guys.